Good afternoon. I'd like to um, welcome everybody to another installment in the SMFM Fellow Lecture Series. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Stubbe, one of my partners here at UNC. Um, she will be speaking on what every MFM needs to know uh, about breastfeeding. We welcome her back. Years ago, she gave this talk um, in, our, in our same forum, um, and I think it's great to revisit again. Just as a tidbit again, we'll have her lecture um, and then have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. Um, either raise your hand, unmute your microphone, turn on your web camera, and you can chat directly to Dr. Stubbe um, or type in your questions, um, and we'll pass those along to her. Great, exciting stuff in the next lecture series if you haven't seen on the website. Um, the next two lectures will be part of a series on HIV and pregnancy. Um, so June 18th and June 2nd will both be great lectures on HIV care during pregnancy and HIV testing. So uh, tune in again for those. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Stubbe um, for uh, joining us today. Um, and we will turn it over to her um, for her uh, talk. Thanks, Allison. Thanks so much. Well, it's great to virtually see all of you this morning, afternoon, depending on where you are. And we're going to talk today about what every MFM needs to know about breastfeeding. Um, so um, I wanted just to start by talking a little bit about why should MFMs know about breastfeeding. Um, and what I hope to convince you over the next 45 minutes or so is that as high-risk pregnancy experts, we can share evidence-based guidelines to enable more mothers to achieve their breastfeeding goals and longer, better breastfeeding improves outcomes for moms and babies. So this is part of reproductive physiology and part of the reproductive continuum. Um, moms and babies remain connected by breastfeeding after we clamp the cord, and so we should help them to do so successfully. So we're gonna talk about four different things today. The first is prenatal care, and I'm gonna share some data about how OB provider advice improves breastfeeding initiation and duration and give you some tips about how to talk about breastfeeding with your patients in the prenatal period. I'm going to focus on preterm birth, because infants who are not fed mother's milk have higher infectious morbidity in the NICU. Um, and clearly, we want our babies who are in the NICU to have good outcomes. I'm going to talk a little bit about consultations. MFM physicians can provide guidance on maternal medical conditions and lactation. We're going to talk about medications. We're also going to talk about um, type 1 diabetes as an example of a medical condition that may affect breastfeeding and that breastfeeding may affect. And then finally, I want to share a little bit of data about long-term maternal health, where we know that never or curtailed breastfeeding is associated with increased lifelong health risks for women. So when we think about pregnancy as a window to future health, um, I'd like to suggest that lactation is an opportunity to make the picture out of that window more positive in the long term. So first, let's talk a little bit about prenatal care. Um, and to set the stage, I just wanted to review the data on the association between formula feeding, and adverse outcomes for moms and babies. Um, these data come from the AHRQ evidence report that was published in 2007, as well as a review article that Bill Schwartz and I wrote in um, Perinatology in 2010. Um, and what we see is that formula feeding or not breastfeeding are associated with higher odds of diarrhea, otitis media, pneumonia, SIDS, asthma, and leukemia for infants. Um, and perhaps most importantly for the patients that we care for, a 2.4-fold odds of necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, clearly, that's a bad thing. And if we could help, particularly our moms with preterm babies, to successfully provide milk for their infants, we can make a real difference. Um, for mothers, there's growing evidence that not breastfeeding or curtailed breastfeeding increases risks of premature breast cancer, ovarian cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart attacks, and hypertension. Um, and these are all aspects of future health that we very much want to address. An important caveat to all of these data is that they're from observational studies. And we know that moms who breastfeed differ in myriad ways from moms who choose not to breastfeed. All of these studies control for that as much as possible, but I want to come out and be clear that it is likely that there is some residual confounding the associations, but there's also some strong biological plausibility that some of those associations are real. And certainly, as people who care about maternal health and infant health, we want to make sure that if a mom wants to breastfeed, we do everything in our power to make it possible for her to do so. 
So this is just a cost analysis that was published in Pediatrics in 2010 that looks at the burden of suboptimal breastfeeding in terms of infant health. And the authors found that about 250 excess neck deaths are associated with suboptimal breastfeeding in the United States. Um, there also are um, about 447 excess SIDS deaths and excess deaths associated with lower respiratory tract infections. And this was comparing current breastfeeding rates from what we might uh, foresee if 90% of families adhered with a recommendation for six months of exclusive breastfeeding. Um, so I share these data simply to say that this is not a minor, small, insignificant part of the picture in terms of health costs and public health impact. So it is based on these kinds of data that the AAP recommends exclusive breastfeeding for about six months with continuation of breastfeeding for one year or longer as mutually desired by mother and infant. Um, I always highlight this one year or longer because in America, at least, there are a lot of people who get really queasy with the idea of a kid older than about two weeks breastfeeding, much less a one-year-old breastfeeding. Um, and as MFM providers, we should be aware that if we're seeing a multiple-birth woman, she may still be breastfeeding her 18-month-old. Um, if she's at high risk of preterm labor, we may want to talk with her about that, but we should be aware of that and we shouldn't, you know, make an oof face if she tells us that she's breastfeeding her kid who's older than um, older than a year. Um, the World Health Organization actually recommends at least two years of breastfeeding per child. Um, so the one year or longer in the United States is actually less than um, international authorities recommend for breastfeeding duration. How long is too long? You know, six, clearly too long, um, but we can talk about that further at the break. Um, so how are we doing in the United States with breastfeeding? Um, these are data on um, the most recent data available from CDC on what's actually happening and then the Healthy People 2020 goals. And I just wanted to draw your attention to um, the, let me get my arrow here, um, the, recommend, the goal for breastfeeding for a year, the Healthy People 2020, 2020 goal is 34%. Remember the AAP recommendation is that all babies be breastfed for a year. Um, where we are is about 27%. Um, another place where we fall far short, the recommendation is exclusive breastfeeding for at least six months for all babies, and the actual number is about 16% a month in the United States. Um, so we have a ways to go. Um, I also wanted to highlight that Healthy People 2020, for the first time, explicitly included breastfeeding support as a Healthy People 2020 target. Um, so whereas for a long time it's simply been we just need to, you know, yell at women to breastfeed more, which is not something I endorse. Um, Healthy People 2020 pointed out that there are forces that affect whether moms are able to breastfeed. So they specifically targeted worksite lactation support programs, reducing the proportion of breastfed newborns to receive formula in the first two days of life, which if they're healthy term newborns is typically not indicated, um, and then increase the proportion of births that occur in facilities that provide recommended care. And this is indexed by baby friendly hospitals. Um, so I know more and more U.S. hospitals are uh, moving toward baby-friendly status, and many of you all may have experience with that. Um, the goal was 8.1%, and we're already at 7.2%, thanks to NICHQ and various other CDC efforts. Um, so breastfeeding isn't simply about telling moms to breastfeed. It's about making it possible for them to do so. So how can we help as OB providers? I think it's really important to realize that patients listen to what their doctors say about breastfeeding. And this was a study that looked at the patient's perception of their healthcare provider opinion um, and whether they were breastfeeding at six weeks postpartum. Um, and if they perceived that either the physician or hospital staff favored breastfeeding, 70 and 73% were still breastfeeding at six weeks. If they perceived that the healthcare provider had no preference, the rates were much lower. And if they perceived that the healthcare provider favored formula, their rates were even lower than that. Um, and that becomes really important because if we don't say anything to our patients about breastfeeding, they're going to be in this no preference space. And I would argue that from a public health standpoint, we should recommend breastfeeding unless it's contraindicated. Um, so it's really important that, that those words come out of your mouth in your interactions with patients. And most OBs don't think patients care what they have to say. This is a study con conducted in Boston by Elsie Tavares, and she asked patients how they perceived their OB provider's advice about whether to breastfeed and how long to breastfeed. And then they asked obstetricians whether they thought that advice was important. And you can see that only 8% of obstetricians thought their advice on duration of breastfeeding was important, whereas a third of patients thought their provider's advice was important. Obviously, I'd like to think that 100% of 
patients think what we have to say is important, but clearly we underestimate how much they care about what we have to say. So how do we express to patients our recommendations? Um, I think it's really important to avoid what seems like a very straightforward question. Um, when I first started doing prenatal care, I would ask my patients, are you planning to breastfeed or bottle feed? Um, and there's a problem with that question. Because if she says I'm planning to bottle feed, you're kind of left with two options. You can say, well, gosh, I don't think you should do that, in which case you're having an argument with the patient. Or you can say, OK, and check off a box and move on. Um, a better question to ask is, what have you heard about breastfeeding? Um, and this kind of open-ended question lets you figure out kind of where the patient's sitting on the continuum and tailor your, and tailor your counseling accordingly. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes about using this approach is that an OB provider asked the patient, what have you heard about breastfeeding? And the mom said, oh, no, I can't do that. It's, it's awful. It's painful. And the OB provider probed and said, well, how do you mean it's painful? And the patient said, well, I don't know what they use to make the holes in your nipples with, but I am not doing that. And, and somehow this woman had, I guess she looked at a baby bottle, and the nipples have a little crosshatch in the end, and she looked at her nipples, and there was no crosshatch in the end, and she heard it was painful, and she put two and two together and figured there was some kind of nipple piercing procedure she was going to have to undergo if she wanted to breastfeed. And understandably, she said she wanted no part of that. Um, well, when her provider counseled her that actually the holes in her nipples are already there and she didn't need to have them pierced, the patient said, oh, well, in that case, I'd love to breastfeed. And the conversation was completely different. Now, probably most patients aren't going to tell you that it's the nipple piercing that's keeping them from breastfeeding. But asking what have you heard can be terribly informative. Um, and this is the first step of what's called the three-step counseling method for health behavior change. So first, you ask the patient, what have you heard? And you listen to what she has to say. And then you paraphrase in your own words what the patient said so that she understands Understands that you, the very busy healthcare provider who might be busy feeding the epic monster computer system that we just installed here at UNC, actually was listening and not just typing stuff on the screen. Um, so you might say, it sounds like you're worried that breastfeeding will be painful. And the patient says, oh gosh, they, they were listening to me. They're not just typing stuff on the computer. Um, and then you tell your, tell your education to the patient's specific concerns. Um, so in the case of pain, you might talk about concrete strategies for how to latch a baby comfortably or the availability of lactation consultants in your hospital, or how to get support after discharge, so that you're specifically addressing that mom's concerns around breastfeeding. Um, this is much more effective than saying, all women should breastfeed for six months, and if you don't, you're a bad person, which is not a good idea on many levels, or even just saying, all women should breastfeed and moving on. So open-ended question, paraphrase, in patient, paraphrase what the patient says in your own words, and then specifically tailor your counseling to that concern. Um, the fellows at UNC will know that this is my favorite question, style of question to ask my first day on antepartum rounds when I'm meeting a patient for the first time. And I say, what have you heard about preeclampsia, PPROM, preterm labor? Um, and it's amazing what patients know and what they don't know and how much easier it is to know what to say once you figure out where their baseline understanding is. So I recommend trying this at home. So that's a little bit about prenatal care. Then I want to zoom in and focus on the issue of preterm birth and the infectious morbidity associated with not getting mother's own milk. I want to start with a case of three. This was a patient I took care of, I think, when I was a chief resident at Brigham and Women's in Boston, 27-year-old G2P1, who presented fully dilated bulging bag um, with Modi twins. Um, and between contractions, she screams, or my baby's going to be OK. Um, bedside scan, vertex breach twins. First baby comes out in the bed on the way to the OR. And because these were, um, I think they were 27 weekers, we went ahead and section for the second baby um, under general anesthesia. It was a huge, chaotic event. Um, and as mom is being extubated, I look over to the patient and say, are you going to breastfeed? She says, no. I hadn't learned about the three-step counseling at that point. There was no further discussion with the OB team. Twin B developed pulmonary hemorrhage, grade 4 IVH, and died on day of life 4. Twin A initially did well, but on day of life developed NAC, was managed conservatively with AMP, Gent, and Clinda, and had complications including ATN, grade 3 IVH, and prolonged ventilation with an oscillator. And why am I telling you this story in the midst of a discussion of breastfeeding? Well, we know that human milk feeding markedly reduces the risk of NAC. And so I was left wondering if I had maybe asked 
said something other than okay when mom said, oh no, I'm going to formula feed, might we have been able to do better for baby A? Um, human milk feeding is strongly associated with improved outcomes in the NICU. And I wondered, could better counseling have influenced the outcome for these babies? These are some data published out of the Neonatal Research Network looking at the association between the proportion of human milk to total intake over the first 14 days of life um, and um, neck or death-free survival. And what you see is for babies who got 100% mom's milk, the uh, proportion who, who, who survived free of neck is far higher at 120 days than the group who received no human milk. So there's about a 15% neck or mortality in the group that received no milk, and there's about a 2.5% neck or mortality in the, mom, in the babies who received mother's own milk exclusively. And this is adjusted for a variety of factors that we think that we would associate with adverse outcomes in, in preterm infants. This is one of many studies that look at the relationship between human milk and neck. So why would this be? Um, it turns out that formula is very different from human milk. And this is a microscope slide looking at formula, which is just gray stuff, and looking at human milk, which has numerous cellular components as well as non-cellular components that confer immunity for the baby. It turns out that there are macrophages and neutrophils in milk that are active in the infant gut. There are also, there are also growth factors like EGF, TGF-alpha, and enzymes and cytokines, which can modulate inflammation and, uh, and oxidative stress. One of the really fascinating aspects um, relates to the immune response. Um, and it turns out that there is an enteromammary immune system that I'll talk about for the next couple of slides that modulates the type of secretary IgA that is present in an individual mother's milk. This is a study that looked at this in a population of women in Sri Lanka, a population of women who immigrated from Sri Lanka to the United Kingdom, and a population of Caucasian women. And what they found was the breast milk of mom in Sri Lanka, 6% of the time, contained antibodies to an E. coli that was endemic to the Indian subcontinent. If you had immigrated from Sri Lanka, about 4% of those moms had those antibodies. And if you had lived in the UK your whole life, only 1% had those antibodies. So a mother's milk and its specific immunity is tailored to that mom's environment and her experience. To the extent that the baby and the mom share an environment, then that mom is delivering immunity to the specific pathogens to which that mother-baby dyad are exposed. And this is um, something driven by what's called the enteromammary immune system. So mom ingests or is exposed to a pathogen. The pathogen travels to the maternal gut, goes to the mesenteric node. The, um, plasma cells um, travel through the thoracic duct to the, to the bloodstream, to the breast and then deposit IgA specific for those organisms in the infant gut. And this is just a schematic showing in the intestinal mucosa a primed IgA beta cell which travels through the blood to become a plasma cell to release specific IgA into the mammary epithelium and thence into the milk where it could enter the um, infant intestinal mucosa. Um, so there's a pretty amazing thing going on here. Um, and there's recent evidence that um, the microbiota of the maternal um, digestive system also travel through an as yet undefined mechanism to the breast milk, um, colonizing the baby's gut with an appropriate microbiome. There are also oligosaccharides present in breast milk that can prevent infection. Um, so this is an example of the norovirus receptor, which is a bad thing to have in your gut if you're exposed to norovirus. Um, there actually are oligosaccharides which mimic the neurovirus receptor and actually bind to neurovirus, preventing it from binding to the breastfed infant's gut. And there are various oligosaccharides that are also thought to play a role in neck prevention and therefore um, reducing the risk of necrotizing and arcolitis in babies who receive human milk. There's some really fascinating biology going on here. Well, the question is, you know, a mom has just had a preterm baby, though she's stressed out and, and she's upset and we don't want to bother her. And the dogma is often that it's just too stressful, the mother's too tired, she's too sick, we certainly don't want to talk about this breastfeeding until she's had a little while to kind of pull herself together. Um, and there's a really wonderful qualitative study that's published out of Rush Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago, looking at the kinds of things that dominantly low-income, low-SES mothers said about pumping for their NICU babies. This is, mom, they told me, we cannot clone your milk. No doctor, no nurse, nobody can give him this. 
only his mom can give him this. So we went on ahead and did it because I knew I w it was going to make him better and help him. Another mom says, even if I can't be there for him every single day, I'm pumping still. So you feel like you're doing something for him. Another mom said, it's providing milk, doing something for him. It's very rewarding and it's sustaining his life. And he's gaining weight, so it especially makes you feel good. And I think this article really underscores the fact that if framed appropriately, this can be something that moms feel like they bring to the table. And the UNC fellows can attest, because they've heard it way too many times, that when I'm talking to an immediately postpartum mom, I will tell them, and they're pumping, and I say, you're awesome, that's amazing. When you go down to the NICU with that little bottle of colostrum, everybody ought to step aside, because there are a lot of really smart doctors and nurses in the NICU, but none of them have what you have. And I think it really does give these moms who feel like their body has failed them and failed their babies an opportunity to do something for their baby and participate actively in the care. Um, this was another study out of Paula Meyer's group at Rush looking at 21 moms of very low birth weight infants who had all been planning to formula feed. Uh, many of them didn't know anyone who'd breastfed. They were worried about pain. They were worried about lifestyle issues. They were approached by peer counselors at Rush all of them breastfed at least 30 days. 19 went on to feed their babies at breast. And two of them actually became peer counselors. And all of them died feeling guilty or coerced. So I think it's entirely possible to talk to preterm moms about breastfeeding in a way that is not coercive and that is empowering. Um, clearly saying if you formula feed your kid, you're evil is not the right thing to say. But speaking with moms about the fact that mother's milk is like medicine, and might they be willing to pump milk while their babies are in the NICU, even if they hadn't planned to breastfeed, can be really powerful and important. That's a little bit on the counseling. Well, how exactly does this breastfeeding thing work? And how can we use that information to help our moms be successful? So this is a schematic looking at the various factors involved in milk production. And the two key players that we all know from medical school are prolactin and oxytocin. Um, both of these are produced um, in the pituitary. And prolactin is responsible for milk synthesis and oxytocin for milk secretion. Now, during pregnancy, progesterone produced by the placenta blocks the action of prolactin, preventing milk synthesis. We also know that other endocrine factors, including cortisol, thyroid, insulin, and growth hormone, play a role in both breast development during pregnancy and in milk synthesis. And so dysregulation of any of these can potentially impact milk production. At delivery. Baby comes on the scene, and the placenta and progesterone go away, and milk production actually commences. And I want to talk specifically about the role of oxytocin in milk production because it's quite important to how we think about helping our preterm moms be successful. So I like to talk about the three elements of breastfeeding success. There is letdown, latch, and moving milk. And letdown is a really critical first step. So Many of you all know that my first baby was born the night before the match as a fourth year medical student. So I started residency with a Medela pump and sew on my back, schlepping it around, bringing it to the women's hospital. Um, and I think I was probably six months into this whole enterprise before I understood that it wasn't actually the pump that was getting the milk out, nor was it my baby's jaws of steel that was moving the milk out through these individual breast ducts and down into his mouth. It was rather the effect of my epithelial cells that facilitate letdown. So this is schematic of an individual lobule of um, lactocytes. These lactocytes all produce milk. The milk sits in the lumen. And then each lobule is wrapped in myoepithelial cells. And those myoepithelial cells, like the ones in the uterus that we all know very well, respond to oxytocin. When oxytocin is released, this lobule squeezes and literally pushes the milk out through the duct down to the level of the areola where the baby or the pump can actually extract it. Now, over here, you're wondering what this painting is, perhaps. This is a painting of Hera, who was the queen of the gods in Greek mythology. Um, and as you may remember, if you read Percy Jackson, or if you, if your children are reading Percy Jackson, or if you remember Greek mythology from middle school, um, Hera was married to Zeus. Um, and Zeus, like many political leaders, had a number of consorts with people to whom he was not Um, 
And many of those individuals were not goddesses, they were mortal women. And the problem was in Greek mythology, if a god and a mortal conceived a child, the child would not live forever, unless the Greeks believed that infant were fed the milk of a goddess. So Zeus was particularly fond of one of his kids, Hercules. This is Hercules here. And you can tell that he's following recommendations for WHO breastfeeding duration, because with that muscle structure, he's got to be at least three or four years old. Um, so Zeus brings him up to Mount Olympus and tries to place him on Hera's breast so that he, he can drink the milk of a goddess. And Hera wakes up and says, this is not my kid. And her milk shoots across the sky, becoming the Milky Way galaxy. So the, word, the Milky Way's name actually comes from this piece of Greek mythology. And the word galaxy comes from the Greek galactose, which means milk. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because oxytocin is incredibly powerful. And if moms don't have oxytocin and don't achieve letdown, the milk is not going to come out of their breasts, and they're not going to be able to produce milk for a pump or produce milk for their babies. So oxytocin is critical. And interestingly, pain and stress and anxiety can interfere with milk letdown, likely through mechanisms related to oxytocin. So this is a really old but really fabulous study um, from 1948 conducted by Niles Newton. And Niles was a, a psychology researcher and a real pioneer in breastfeeding um, who got interested in the dairy literature, which showed that if you distract a cow while you're milking it, the cow makes less milk. And apparently the way you distracted a cow in this experimental paradigm was to pop a paper bag over the cow's head while it was being milked which always strikes me as a really dangerous protocol. But nevertheless, um, she read about this and she thought, gosh, I wonder what happens to a mom if you distract her while her baby is nursing. So she and her husband designed a little experimental protocol and she conveniently had a seven month old infant at home. So in the morning, Niles would weigh her baby and then breastfeed and then weigh her baby again to see how much milk was transferred. And in the control condition, you can see over here, it was about 170 grams of milk. Now, then she did different things to herself. She put her feet in ice water. She had her husband ask her difficult math questions and shock her if she got them wrong. She had him wrap a piece of gauze around her big toe and pull until it was painful. You can see here that the baby got a lot less milk unless she got a concurrent injection of oxytocin. And she was blinded to whether she received the saline or the oxytocin. And she concluded from this that pain and stress adversely affect letdown. Um, and this is likely mediated by oxytocin because giving oxytocin rescues this effect. So you can see this clinically without violating the, without encountering an IRB battle, because I doubt this particular protocol would be approved today. Um, when you sit down on postpartum rounds with a mom who's trying to nurse and she's all discombobulated and nervous, um, and if you start chatting with her and you tell some dumb joke or come up with some conversation, you'll notice that the baby goes from kind of trying to get milk and looking kind of concerned to going, go, go, because as you take mom's feet out of the ice water, as you help her be calm and confident, she's going to release oxytocin, and there's going to be a letdown, and suddenly that baby's going to have milk to drink. Um, so try this, try this in post, when you're seeing moms in the clinic postpartum. If mom is laughing and in a good, happy place, the milk is going to flow. Um, those of y'all who have pumped or who've had colleagues who have pumped, the same thing happens. If you're sitting hooked up to the pump, and someone is hammer paging you about something you have to do on the floors, the milk isn't going to flow. But if you can take a deep breath and be left alone for 10 minutes, suddenly there's actually going to be milk there. So this is an important clinical pearl. If you want your co-fellow to come back from pumping quickly, don't bother her while she's doing it, and she will be back much sooner. So the next critical piece to breastfeeding success is latch. And in a term baby, this is a well-latched baby, and you can see its mouth is flanged way out like this, almost 180 degrees. This is not a well-latched baby. This is a baby who is essentially chewing on the tip of its mom's nipple. This hurts like hell. And this also totally messes up the breastfeeding. Because if you can imagine, let's see if we can do this on the screen, if this is the breast and this is the baby and the baby is chewing on the end of the breast, the milk that's supposed to be flowing out of the breast can't get out because baby's basically stepping on the hose where the water's supposed to be coming out. So baby needs to open really wide and take most of the nipple and areola in its mouth so that it can actually extract the milk from the breast. And this is a great way to teach. You show the patient this is the breast, here comes the baby, the baby opens wide, pulls the nipple and areola. It really just goes to the junction of the hard and soft palate in the back of the baby's mouth in order to get a good latch. It's important to counsel moms that if the baby isn't latched well, 
you want her to use a pinky finger to break the seal and not just pull the kid off because that does not feel good. It doesn't sound like it feels good and it does not feel good. Um, so in the case of our NICU moms, of course, they're not going to be latching their babies from the beginning. They're going to be pumping. Um, and actually, as you know, if you've ever done a breast exam, not all breast and nipples are the same size. Um, this is a well-fitted pump flange. And you can see that most of the shaft of the nipple comes in but the, and the areola is there. This is a pump flange that's too large and it's, the nipple is moving too freely and too much of the areola is being dragged in. This is one that's too small and it can't even fit in at all. And this is just yanking on the tip of the nipple. Um, so the pump kits come with one size flange and moms need to be encouraged to make sure they fit correctly. And hopefully you have lactation consultants you work with who can assist with this. Um, but using the wrong pump shield can cause a whole lot of pain for moms and can also keep the milk from actually draining because if it's crunching um, the ducts, then they're not going to be able to remove the milk appropriately. And there's a reference here to a um, pump shield fitting instruction page. So the last part of breastfeeding success is moving milk. And it's important to understand that as the breast lobules become fuller, there's actually a downregulation of prolactin receptors by a milk whey protein called feedback inhibitor of lactation. So if mom isn't regularly emptying the breast, her body will reduce its response to prolactin and make less milk. And that's what's supposed to happen in, in negative feedback. However, if that negative feedback is happening because mom doesn't have a pump, doesn't pump frequently enough, um, doesn't have a workplace that accommodates her, she's going to make less milk not because she doesn't need it, but because she doesn't have appropriate physiology. So for the preterm infant, the recommendation is to begin pumping within six hours of birth and preferably sooner, pump six to eight times a day, and then to use breast massage to improve milk transfer. And I'm going to share some data on the effectiveness of that in a moment. So this was a study recently published in the Journal of Perinatology that looked at the effect of pumping initiation in less than an hour after birth versus one to six hours after birth. And they looked at the volume of milk produced initially and then on days one to seven, the total at the end of week one, and then at three weeks and six weeks. And what you see is that initiating with one hour made, within an hour made a tremendous difference in the total amount of milk expressed in the first week. Um, and then at three and six weeks, there continued to be a huge difference in the amount of milk that mother were able to make. Of note, the early initiate the moms randomized to early initiation were also more likely to still be pumping at three weeks and six weeks. So this is of those still pumping at this particular time point. So if we can help mom get to the pump in that first hour, and that's an hour when she's still on labor and delivery, or get to hand express, and we'll talk about that in a second, we can potentially have a profound impact on how much milk she can give her baby. And remember, it was those babies who got 100% mother's milk in the first two weeks who had a markedly lower risk of neck than the babies who got only formula. So we can do something in that first hour or two that can have a tremendous impact on long-term outcomes for this mom and baby dyad. And I think when we also realize how meaningful it is to moms to be able to bring milk to their babies, these moms are going to feel a lot better about themselves than these moms. So we need to help moms get started as early as possible. And that's going to mean working with our colleagues in labor and delivery to get a pump or at least get hand expression started very early. This is another, this is an observational study by Jane Morton that looked at the effect of what's called hands-on pumping. And the concept here is this group three used hand expression in the first couple of days of life to help to express colostrum. And in the first two days, moms don't get large volumes of milk. They get very small amounts of colostrum. But what Morton was able to show is the moms who received instruction and did hand expression five or more times a day in the first few days had considerably more milk at eight weeks than the moms who um, did hand expression less than twice a day. Um, and you can see that these differences are statistically significant. So this is actually a really important pearl when you're dealing with the mom who's on um, labor and delivery. 
because you don't need to go get the whole pump and style Medela and all the pump parts and the flanges. If you can just bring her some little snappy bottles and you work with her labor delivery nurse to show her how to hand express a couple of drops in, of colostrum into that little bottle without all the hoopla and paraphernalia, that colostrum can go right over to the NICU to be swabbed in the baby's mouth to reduce the risk of neck. Um, and then mom started pumping. So she doesn't have to have the whole pump extravaganza. She just needs to start expressing milk early. And I'll give you a reference to a video that Jane Morton put together that shows how to do this that you can share with your patients. So when we think about supporting preterm human milk feeding, you've got to start by starting the conversation. Routine visits and preconception counseling are critically important. Your office routines, um, please don't give out preformula samples in your prenatal clinics because that is, has been shown in randomized trials to reduce breastfeeding duration and gives the message that you don't really care what she does because you're advertising for formula, so it must be just as good as breast milk. Um, share the data with mom. And um, Paula Meyer talks about saying that mother's milk is medicine for preterm babies. So that if they didn't want to breastfeed and they weren't interested in the whole breastfeeding thing, they understand that this is about providing a critical nutrient to their babies. And this may be more appealing to moms who weren't really interested in breastfeeding per se. Ask, would you be willing to pump mom milk for your baby while he or she is in the NICU. And then start early. Initiate as soon as feasible after birth to optimize milk expression and teach hands-on pumping and hand expression during those first couple of days to increase long-term milk production. Now I want to switch gears and think about consultations. When you're seeing um, high-risk complicated pregnancies in the clinic, what can you do to help um, optimize chances for successful lactation for moms and babies? So the question that everybody asks is, is this drug safe for breastfeeding? And the fact is that physicians are notoriously not good at answering this question accurately. This is an older study that was done in 2000 that looked at the opinions of physicians about whether PTU was safe in breastfeeding. Um, and it turns out that although the, at that point the AAP had said that PTU was absolutely safe in breastfeeding, um, a substantial proportion of physicians told moms that actually, no, they couldn't breastfeed, they should formula feed. Um, and the advice that moms received from physicians was the only statistically significant predictor of whether they breastfed um, with an odds ratio of 5.5. So when we give that information, moms act on it. And when we tell them they should formula feed because of the medication without looking up whether or not it's safe, they will formula feed. And that mom and baby miss out on an opportunity to breastfeed. So when we think about drug safety and lactation, it's important to at least have a conceptual idea of how drugs get into milk. And this is kind of a layering of two diagrams of drug entry and clearance. So here's mom. Drug enters mom's plasma in some amount, depending on its dosing and mode of administration. It's cleared from mom's body through drug metabolism. And then some of it enters into milk. And the amount of drug that enters into milk depends on molecular weight, ionization, solubility, protein binding, mechanisms of transport, on a variety of factors. And you'll see these arrows go two directions. And that's quite important. Because as a drug clears from maternal plasma, it will also clear from the breast milk in most cases. Probably the most um, concrete and relevant to the majority example of this is alcohol. So if a mom drinks a glass of wine and doesn't breastfeed for three hours, and her blood alcohol level goes down to zero, her milk alcohol level will also go down to zero. She doesn't have to pump and dump to get rid of that milk because she had a glass of wine. Now, if she has 10 glasses of wine, her milk alcohol level will probably not go down to zero in the time frame before she needs to pump again, and that milk she'll need to throw away. Um, but typically, for an average-sized woman, after two hours, one drink will be completely cleared from her blood and thus completely cleared from her milk. So once the drug gets into milk, it is ingested orally by the infant. And depending on the features of that drug, it may or may not enter the infant plasma. And the relative infant dose is calculated as the percent of a therapeutic dose on a milligram per kilogram basis that the infant receives via breast milk. And then the drug will be cleared from the baby. And the clearance will depend on the age of the child, the gestational age, and concurrent illness. Um, a critically ill baby in the NICU is going to have different drug clearance than an 18-month-old who, who has an entirely different liver and an entirely different set of kidneys. So let's think about applying this to a concrete example. Um, you have a 39-year-old who's six weeks postpartum with persistently elevated blood pressures and type 2 diabetes, and her primary care provider prescribes an Alipril. She goes to CVS to fill the prescription, and the pharmacist says, oh, no, you can't take an Alipril when you're breastfeeding. And she calls your office as the 
high-risk pregnancy expert and asked what to do. Well, if you were to look at the official FDA insert for enalapril, it says, enalapril and enalaprilat, which is its metabolite, have been detected in human breast milk. Because of the potential for serious adverse reactions in infants nursing from enalapril, a decision should be made whether to discontinue nursing or discontinue enalapril, taking into account the importance of the drug to the mother. And this is one of these things that's a little bit like the FDA labeling for drugs in pregnancy. It is notoriously unhelpful and not really the information that's appropriate to share to make a really informed decision. Um, so let's talk about enalapril. Enalapril enters the plasma and is metabolized into enalaprilat. It's renally cleared. Both enalapril and enalaprilat are present in milk in low levels. Um, but the enalaprilat is not orally bioavailable. So it's only the enalapril that reaches the infant plasma that has potential pharmacologic effects. And the relative infant dose is 0.7 to 0.2% of a therapeutic dose. So a minimal amount of drug actually reaches the baby. And if you look this up in Medications in Mother's Milk, which is a high-quality evidence-based book about drugs and lactation, it's rated as probably compatible. And Tom Hale, the author, concludes some caution is recommended in using ACE inhibitors in mothers with preterm infants due to possible renal toxicity. But if this is a term baby, a six-week-old, a tiny amount of drug is actually getting into milk. And this is a mom who, as we'll talk about in a little bit, with a type 2 diabetes might actually benefit from breastfeeding. Um, and this is a baby whose mom has type 2 diabetes and is probably obese who would probably benefit from the reduced risk of obesity associated with lactation. Um, so this is just one example of where the data are not consistent. Um, it's also an example illustrating that the placenta and the breast are not the same. Now, all of you are MFM, so I know you've seen the placenta and you've seen a breast. But it is incredibly common. In fact, it is almost a truism that a clinician will say, well, you can't take ACE inhibitors in pregnancy, so you can't take them in breastfeeding. Um, and in fact, the placenta is obviously entirely different than the breast. And drugs that are safe in pregnancy may not be safe in breastfeeding. And drugs that are safe in breastfeeding may not be safe in pregnancy. So if you hear yourself saying, well, I know blah in pregnancy, so it must be blah in, in breastfeeding, think for a moment about the last placenta you saw and the last breast you saw. And if they look the same, we have a problem. Um, if they don't look the same, look up whether the drug is safe in lactation before making an assumption one way or the other. So an important additional caveat is that not all places you look this information up are considered equal. Um, and this was a study that looked at 14 drugs commonly prescribed in women of childbearing age, which are listed here, um, in a number of different resources. And the authors found that Medication in Mother's Milk, which is Tom Hill's book, and LactMed, which is a resource I'll talk about in a moment, rated 12 of the 14 to be compatible with breastfeeding. But if you look at the PDR, Physician's desk reference, zero were rated, rated as compatible. And if you look at First Data Bank, which is what CVS and many commercial pharmacies use to print out the drug safety information to hand to our moms, only two of them were considered to be safe in lactation. So you look up the drug, you review the evidence, you discuss it with mom, you write the prescription, she goes to CVS, and she gets a piece of paper that says, do not take this drug while breastfeeding. Um, and one of two things will happen. Either she will not take the drug and keep breastfeeding, or she will stop breastfeeding and take the drug. So it's critically important to educate moms and let them know that the information they get may not necessarily be accurate. So what is good information? Um, if you don't already have the LactMed app on your iPhone or Android, please download it. Um, this is a great resource, and it's updated continuously with a review of the literature. So everybody, please, who's got your cell phone out already, tune in for a moment and download this app, and then you can return to checking your email. Um, and use this as a resource. Um, it's also available online at lactmed.nlm.nih.gov, or if you can just Google LactMed, you will find it. Um, and it's an incredibly useful resource for looking up what drugs are actually safe in lactation. So just one more example of drug safety. You have a 26-year-old two weeks postpartum with seasonal allergies. She's breastfeeding and asks if she can take Sudafed. Um, if you look this up in some resources, they actually say that it's fine, um, including the AAP ratings from 2001. But a, a, in a crossover placebo-designed trial, moms who took 60 milligrams of Sudafed once had a marked reduction in their 24-hour milk production compared to moms who, the same moms receiving placebo. Um, so if a mom is taking Sudafed, she will markedly reduce her own milk production. Um, and if you look this up in Briggs, um, Drugs and Pregnancy and Lactation, it says it's probably okay. Um, so it's really important to look in a high-quality resource to make sure that the information you have is accurate. 
Um, otherwise, this mom is going to say, I don't have enough milk and start formula supplementing because of incomplete information. So in terms of counseling and follow-up, I will actually print out the Laxman monograph on a particular drug if it's not something totally uncontroversial. Um, I'll review it with the patient and talk about the risks of infant drug exposure versus the risks of formula feeding for both mom and infant. Because we're not comparing totally safe, perfect food with breast milk adulterated with, formula, with um, medication. It's a question of the risk of medication exposure versus the risks of not breastfeeding. While mom is taking the medication, I encourage her to share that monograph with her pediatric provider. A lot of pediatricians haven't looked up in LACMED. And if mom says, oh, and I'm taking blah, that I, my, you know, I'm, I'm taking enalapril, they would say, oh my god, that's dangerous in pregnancy. You can't take that when you're breastfeeding. And then all of your counseling is out the window if mom hears their pediatrician say, oh no, you can't take that. Um, and we all hate it when we say something and then the patient hands us a piece of paper contradicting it. So I actually tell them to give it to the nurse who rooms them at the pediatrician. So the nurse can give it to the pediatrician and the pediatrician can read it before they come in and see the patient, thus reducing the risk that the patient and the pediatrician will have to have an argument. Um, I review the common or worrisome side effects for the baby. I tell her that pharmacies may not give her accurate information, and I provide her a contact number to call with questions. So if she has that encounter with a pharmacist, she can call me and we can talk about it. And then you want to time the dose to minimize exposure. So if the baby's sleeping at night, mom can breastfeed, put the baby to bed, take the medication, go to sleep, and the peak drug levels will be passed by the time she wakes up the next morning to pump. So I also wanted to touch on what I'm going to call disease lactation interactions. And there's actually a lot of interesting work around the ways that different health conditions we may manage in our unroutine patients affect breastfeeding and vice versa. I'm going to talk about diabetes just as an example. So we know from several studies that lactogenesis happens later in moms with diabetes than in control moms. And this is a study from the 80s, but there's similar work today, looking at the amount of milk babies transfer if their mom had diabetes versus if their mom was a control. And I believe this is insulin-dependent diabetics. And you can see there's a lot less milk going to the babies of the insulin-dependent diabetics over the first five days of life. We also know that babies of moms on insulin have different feeding behaviors. This was a study that looked at the number of bursts of sucking and the number of sucks per five minutes in infants of insulin-dependent GDM moms, diet-controlled GDM moms, and controls. And what you see is that the babies whose moms were on insulin for their GDM don't suck quite as well as the other kids. Um, and this may be affecting breastfeeding success, in the, particularly in the first few weeks of life. Um, and that's a real bummer because it seems like breast milk might be especially important to the infants of diabetic moms. This was a randomized controlled trial published in the New England Journal in 2010 that looked at um, supplemental feeding of infants with a first-degree relative with type 1 diabetes. And the study specifically selected, based on cord blood genotyping, for an HLA subtype that confers a high risk of type 1 diabetes. And then these babies were randomized to receive either control infant formula or a casein hydroxylate um, hydrolyzed formula that did not have cow's milk protein. And the reason for this is that cow's milk antigen is thought to predispose the development of anti islet cell antibodies. If the babies were breastfed, they breastfed until they needed to supplement with some kind of formula, and they either used the um, the formula to which they were randomized. What the authors found was exposure to cow's milk antigen formula increased the likelihood of developing one or more autoantibody through 10 years of follow-up. Um, so this suggests that if we don't help our type 1 diabetics breastfeed successfully and they introduce formula, we may be increasing their child's risk of type 1 diabetes. So we really want to figure out a way to help these moms be successful. It's important to note that breastfeeding affects the number of units per day of insulin that moms require. And this was a study that looked at insulin dose in early pregnancy, in late pregnancy, and then at one week and six weeks postpartum. And you see here that the moms with um, type 1 diabetes who were breastfeeding had a lower insulin requirement. And the reason for this is that glucose gets mobilized into the breast tissue to synthesize milk. And so if a mom has type 1 diabetes and is breastfeeding, she's going to need less insulin to control her glucose than if she um, is not breastfeeding. An important corollary to that is that insulin seems to be very important for milk synthesis. So if a mom tries to control this just by reducing her basal insulin or reducing her total daily insulin dose rather than by taking in carbohydrates, she may actually adversely affect her ability to make milk. And this is just a, a quick summary of the um, daily nutrient needs of non-pregnant, pregnant, and lactating women 
based on IOM guidelines. Um, and because breastfeeding can cause hypoglycemia in insulin-dependent diabetics, um, Ellen Seeley, who's an endocrinologist at the Brigham, taught me this very straightforward counseling, which is encourage mom to drink a glass of milk when she breastfeeds. Um, if she's breastfeeding her neonate, she doesn't need a 16-ounce glass of milk for the three ounces of breast milk. But it's important that mom not bottom out when she puts the baby to breast. So I last want to just touch briefly on long-term maternal health. Um, and there is some really interesting evidence that never or curtailed breastfeeding is associated with increased lifelong health risks for women. So this was data that we published out of the Nurses Health Study that looked at the association between lifetime duration of breastfeeding and risk of incident type 2 diabetes in the Nurses Health Study. And we found a dose-dependent response that the longer a woman had breastfed across her lifetime, the lower her risk of type 2 diabetes. Relevant to those of us who work at NFM, Erica Gunderson looked at the association between lifetime lactation and metabolic syndrome in women with or without a GDM pregnancy. What she found was here, for the women who breastfed zero to one month's lifetime, those with a GDM birth had a markedly higher incidence of metabolic syndrome than women without a GDM birth. But for moms who had breastfed for at least nine months, lifetime, not nine months for one baby, the risk of metfin was actually almost identical for those with GDM versus those without GDM. Now, there's lots of caveats about whether or not this is causal, but it raises the possibility that helping our GDM moms to breastfeed may reduce their long-term risk of metabolic disease. Finally, we looked in the Nurses' Health Study at the association between duration of lactation per child and hypertension, and found that compared with moms who met the recommendation for 12 months of breastfeeding per kid, those with less than six months all had about a 20% increased hazard ratio of incident hypertension controlling for all of the typical confounders. So it seems like for the metabolic syndrome, for diabetes, for hypertension, we found similar data for MI, not breastfeeding is associated with increased risk. Um, Melissa Bardick and a team of us looked at how this might play out in terms of public health in a paper that was published in the Green last summer. And we found that um, compared with optimal breastfeeding, which would be 90% of women breastfeeding for one year for each child, current breastfeeding rates are associated with 5,000 5, excess cases of breast cancer, 54,000 excess cases of hypertension, um, a non statistically increased risk of type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, about 14,000 excess MIs, and a non significant increase in deaths before age 70. When you look at this in terms of cost, um, current breastfeeding rates incur approximately a billion dollars in medical costs and then about $17 billion in premature death costs in this model. Um, now, there are lots of caveats, and some of this may be residual confounding, but even if half of it is true, I think it argues profoundly that helping moms to breastfeed is an investment not only in their infant's health, but also in their own health. So what does every MFM need to know about breastfeeding? In prenatal care, our advice makes a difference. We should use three-step counseling and open-ended questions to help moms understand, um, to address moms' concerns and help them um, decide whether to breastfeed. For preterm birth, infants who are not fed mother's milk have increased morbidity. And so we should do everything in our power to share this information with moms having preterm births and then enable them to be successful. As, as high-risk pregnancy experts, we can provide guidance on maternal medical conditions and lactation. And we can also think about the potential influence of breastfeeding on long-term maternal health. I want to refer you guys to a couple of resources. The Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine has evidence-based protocols for a variety of different issues involved in management of lactation. They also, um, it's an international society. We need more MFM members, so if I pick anyone's interest, please join the ABM. Um, their deadline for abstracts was just extended. It is now June 13th at midnight. Um, if anyone has any research on lactation they'd like to share, please think about submitting an abstract and coming to Cleveland in November. Um, and lastly, these are some references, including a video on hands-on pumping that's available from Stanford, the AAP statement on breastfeeding, the ACOG Committee on Underserved statement. Um, I put everything I know about clinical management of lactation into an article that was in the green in March. Um, and then here at UNC, we have a breastfeeding web page that has some resources that you might find helpful. So why should MFMs know about breastfeeding? As high-risk pregnancy experts, we can share evidence-based guidelines to enable mothers to achieve their breastfeeding goals. Longer, better breastfeeding improves outcomes for moms and babies. Thank you.
a great question. Um, there are a couple of galacticogs. Well, there are a number of herbs that are marketed as galacticogs for which there's not particularly good data. Fenugreek is the one that I think is most commonly used, and there are some studies suggesting that it doesn't do anything at all, unfortunately. Um, Moringa is another herbal preparation. It's also marketed as Golacta that in a small trial in the Philippines, in a, the Philippine Journal of Pediatrics, improved milk production. There have not been any U.S. studies of that particular supplement. Um, Reglan, um, because it's a dopamine antagonist, raises prolactin levels and has been used as a galactagogue, although in well-designed studies, intensive breastfeeding support with let down latch and moving milk and getting moms to breastfeed more frequently was just as effective as intensive breastfeeding support with Reglan. Um, and I've also seen moms have pretty bad side effects from Reglan, so I've, I'm cautious about using it. It can precipitate anxiety, it can precipitate tardive dyskinesia in a worst case scenario. Um, the other drug that has been used is Zomperidone, which is not available in the U.S. And the FDA issued a black box warning in 2004 saying this drug should never be given to breastfeeding women because it can cause sudden cardiac death. The sort of epi, pharmacoepi studies find that in old diabetic men, Zomperidone is associated with increased risk of sudden cardiac death. Whether data on old diabetic men is generalizable to young lactating women is debatable. Um, the odds ratio is about two, so if it were generalizable, the risk of sudden cardiac death in young lactating women is about one in 100,000 based on national prevalence data, so we'd be doubling that to two in 100,000. Um, that said, here at UNC, I spent three or four years with risk management trying to decide how to thread the needle on this, and our imperfect compromise is a handout that says what I just related to you and says you can buy Dumperidone on the internet. Good luck with that. Um, you know, I think it's available without a prescription from overseas, and that was how we decided to figure out how to do this. Um, the most important piece, though, is more frequent emptying of the breast and working closely with a lactation consultant to restore normal physiology. Um, and then I think Dumperidone is out there. Certainly if your mom had peripartum cardiomyopathy or has an arrhythmia, I would really discourage her from using that. Um, but that is, that is an option. So nothing good is the short answer to that question. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the data on donor milk are not as strong as the data on mother's own milk, but I had a slide that I took out that I believe is a Cochrane meta-analysis that found um, a similar odds ratio for NEC with formula as compared with donor milk. And I think more and more NICUs are using donor milk, particularly in less than 32-week babies, to reduce NEC morbidity. Um, one of the related interesting issues is that NICU milk is commonly fortified, and it's often fortified with a milk-based milk fortifier, and there is an industry-sponsored study from the people who make the human milk derived fortifier showing a higher risk of neck with the cow's milk based fortifier than the human milk based fortifier. I was a little leery of industry funded studies, um, but I think that um, it is increasingly becoming a standard of care to give donor milk to very preterm babies in the NICU. And I think that there's strong biologic plausibility given differences in the composition of milk and things like the human milk oligosaccharides that that would be effective. So I think the interesting question there is, is it the patient's, is it multiple hypertensives or is it the protoplasm of the mom who needs multiple hypertensive meds? And I think that um, one of the interesting sort of thought experiments is if preeclampsia is a disease of inappropriate placental vascular development, what happens to breast vascular development in a mom who has preeclampsia um, in the course of pregnancy that affects how much milk making capacity she actually has? Um, I think that um, similarly there's some work to suggest that um, insulin resistance is a risk factor for low milk supply. So it may be the mom who needs multiple antihypertensives has less milk making capacity. Um, I think clearly if only thinking of potential effects on the baby, polypharmacy has more potential risk than one drug. So going to the smallest number of agents would be optimal. Um, and then I think I've made a really strong push for how important breastfeeding is in this talk. I try to emphasize, particularly with my metabolic syndrome moms who I worry may not be able to make milk, 
that breastfeeding is about a nurturing relationship with their baby at the breast, so that if they aren't able to meet 100% of their baby's needs, they're not feeling like they haven't achieved what's been recommended. So I talk about holding your baby skin to skin, nursing at the breast is really wonderful and important. We want to support that, and we want to give your baby as much milk as you can make, as opposed to if it isn't 100%, then don't even bother. Um, and I think the exclusive breastfeeding recommendation can be challenging in that respect. But I don't know of any good trial that says this antihypertensive is better than that one. Although, multi-center trial opportunity. Let me know who's interested.